Welcome to Everything EOS. Get ready to dive into the fast-paced world of Web3 and join us for the hour as we explore the game-changing ideas and technologies shaping the future of finance, gaming, and beyond with the latest developments on the EOS blockchain, including the rise of GameFi, DeFi, DAOs, NFTs, and more. We've got you covered. Today, I am joined by Kier Kleinecht and Robert Konsdorf, aka Robrigo, of Facings. And we're going to dive into a few interesting topics related to their recent work with the collection manager. And uh, yeah, let's get a little bit of an intro though. How are you guys doing today? Hey, Brandon, thanks for having us. Doing well. <clears throat> I'm Rob, as you mentioned, and here with my partner in Facing Secure. We met actually through an NFT drop on Wax. Garbage fail kids. Turns out Kier is one of the largest garbage fail collectors in the world as wow. far as collection size. And we were really interested in this drop and joined a Telegram channel and <laughs> were friends for about a year and a half and then realized we'd be even better business partners. Awesome. So let's take a few steps back here and maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the creation or how Facings came about. It started off that you were originally part of EOS Detroit, which became Detroit Ledger Technologies or DLT. And then, and Facings was kind of born out of that. Can you give us a little backstory there? Yeah, certainly. So. Back in 2018, when EOS started, I helped co-found EOS Detroit, and you know we started to specialize in engineering. So we wanted to build software with an impact. We wanted to make sure we were supporting the networks that DLT was supporting, and you know over time DLT had actually hopped to a couple different networks, including Telos and Wax. But Wax got really interesting in 2020. So we started to see big brands launch NFT sales on Wax that were doing really well and bringing in a lot of new users that had never been exposed to any EOSIO or Antelope network or really didn't understand Web3 too well. But there was all these new people coming in and using these products and then, you know, joining the community. So we felt that was a really important signal and wanted to dive deeper and start building in the NFT space after that. So in order to give that idea its own identity and sort of life of its own, we, just start, we decided to start a subsidiary company, which became facings and so facings actually was started in 2021 and we started helping to facilitate drops on wax and start to build out our own technology to do these things so really it comes back to an interest in catalyzing the development of new products that can actually help us get closer to mass adoption in the antelope ecosystem so Kier then you you came on the project when facings was already started is that that's correct yeah i came into the project probably a year into uh facings existence actually just in 2022 about halfway through 2022 and you know spurred on by the problems i saw in the ecosphere of all the different games that were going out and all the rug pulls and all the stuff that was going there. I wanted to, I kept digging inside closer and closer towards uh, where this all began and started and realized that, um, that, you know, there was things that I could do to try to help. Started doing that. And then we were talking about it. Rob and I were talking about it on our Telegram chat that we had when we, before we've ever really met, you know, just on Telegram for probably two years. And he said, hey, why don't you, you know, come help me, you know, do the good fight over here and start producing these, uh, uh, you know, these drops with good people and, and, you know, making a difference that way so we can do all the fun stuff that NFTs were supposed to have. 
as well as making it uh, you know cleaner and more accessible. Let's see here. So y'all got involved more recently with the direct grant program on EOS, and you ended up um, producing a public good as a result of that, which is known as the collection manager. And Facing's creator, I guess, is your instance of that. And today we're going to get a little demo of that, but we not quite yet. But maybe you could set that up and tell us a little bit about what the collection manager is and and uh, and how it functions and what people can expect from that. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Happily, so <clears throat> we saw an opportunity to help the EOS ecosystem move forward in terms of NFT tooling and support. And, you know, EOS has always had a special place, at least in my heart, seeing as it's the whole, it's the thing that got me started down the path of entrepreneurship, really. I mean, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but creating a validator or block producer and going through all the motions there and meeting people globally and all of this, it really changed my life. So I've always been committed to coming back and serving EOS when the time was right. And it just felt like this was the right moment. So I got the team on board with that strategy and we decided, hey, look, we can produce open source code, which will create, you know, the sort of substrate or foundation for other businesses and developers, including our own, to have a starting point as far as apps related to Atomic Assets NFT standard goes, which is the big NFT standard in the Antelope ecosystem. So <clears throat> we saw this opportunity and we started thinking about it a lot and figured, you know, hey, there, there are tools like Atomic Hub and others that enable publishers or collection owners to do things with NFTs, but none of those tools are currently open source. So this is an opportunity for us to create a movement around a tool that many people can contribute back to and derive benefit from, including ourselves. So our roadmap as a business is, you know, intertwined with the development of the collection manager. And we're currently we're currently waiting to see if our stage two proposal is approved, which will allow us to release a plugin framework. So businesses will be able to use the open source core, but also keep, you know, their own trade secret plugins that may be monetization strategies or premium features they've spent time building as well as open source plugins as well. Other teams and devs could even submit future grants just to build plugins that will add functionality to the collection manager. So our vision with it is really to create a, a project that, you know, fosters an open source community that is sharing code and contributing back to the core and also enabling businesses with other needs to prosper. Uh, and that's really what we see uh, the, poten the potential of the collection manager being. You know, to further on that a little bit, one of the interesting things that I had seen in the marketplace was all this creativity from developers that were to, that added functionality based on Atomic Assets platform to do different things with NFTs and they were vastly different than other ones. So a lot of smart contract, smart contract writers that really kind of came up with some really creative ways of implementing things with the, the atomic assets platform, but they were singular to the project they were working on and they weren't able to provide that to others because there was nowhere to do it. You could just, it would just be within their own core ecosystem of whatever it was they were developing. What we've created 
is a platform for those people to not only utilize what they created for their own projects, but they could even turn those around and, and hand them to the community so they could be further developed and pushed to make a lot of really exciting and more depth to the process and, and the creation of, of what can come out of all of this. Yeah, it's the beauty of the beauty of open source and and public goods. And I'm really happy to see you all contributing to that on EOS. I'm curious, what has your experience of the direct grant program been like? Meeting milestones, working working through all that and everything. Has it been a good experience so far or Yeah. <clears throat> you know, um we are one of the first grants submitted, I believe as far as our stage one proposal goes so we're we're it in the approval process for our second stage but i'd say overall the process is really well organized in the sense that i like that there is a lot of automation and upfront validation and checking as far as how you apply and how it's a rich structure i understand that enables the ENF to automatically ingest the application and process it quicker. I thought that was slick how that was set up. <clears throat> you know, the ENF is a newer org, obviously, and it seems is scaling pretty rapidly. So, you know, sometimes there would be a period of waiting in between steps or milestone approvals. I think just you know, as a re result of there being a lot of stuff going on. So if I were to provide feedback, it'd be to try to tighten that loop. But I also uh, don't think that that was like any sort of deal breaker. But yeah, I, I think in general, like I have a really positive, we've had a really positive experience and I have a positive outlook on the framework itself and how it works. I think it looks, it seems like there's a lot of good stuff being funded if you just look through the applications and check out the ones that have been approved. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's a, there's definitely a lot going on. And so thanks for being the space monkeys to, to, to dive, to dive headlong into the, um, the direct grant program. Cause, <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of good, a lot of good, a lot of public good can come out of it. And you guys are one of the first, so that's great. Well, before we dive full on into the a demo here of the collection manager, or I guess here it's what we're going to be looking at is more the facings creator. So on your website, you wrote some pretty bold things, and I'm just curious, like, it's you wrote facings is on an odyssey. This is a, from the blog. Facings is on an odyssey toward realizing digital sovereignty for all. Digital sovereignty for all means giving people the value they have earned through fair contribution and the ability to make decisions about that value. And it goes on quite a bit and to lots of thoughts on, you know, equitable, you know, access and stuff like that. So would you guys care to expand on on that and how you see the work you're doing with NFTs tying into to some of these more lofty ambitions? Yeah, I can go into that. You know, when you when you come together and run at a vision as a startup team, you really need to make sure that you're running at the same vision. And so Last year, we got our team together, of which there's seven people currently, and we just talked about what really me what really inspires us and feeds our energy and passion, and you know what is Web three about at the end of the day? It's not about rug pulls and money grabs in NFTs. That's not where this what this is about. Even though, I mean, the majority of the attention in the NFT space has been on those types of things. To me, that statement in the blog was really giving a definition to what we think the essence of Web3 is. And as a Web3 company that's trying to make this 
something useful for the world and not just the niche crypto communities that exist today. To me, it really comes down to this concept of digital sovereignty. And that was something that we saw the team had consensus around. And that's really what brought us into blockchain, crypto, Web3, whatever you want to call it, was, hey, there's an opportunity here to change the way things are done, to transparently reward contributions and effort in a more equitable way where people are getting back what they put in in some regards, um, to allow digital property of which is over a $50 billion industry today to be liberated from the shackles of big corporations, basically, that control everything. I mean, there's people that put years of their life into MMOs and then can arbitrarily be banned and lose everything they've worked for. NFTs and Web3 fixes this. And so it's really about giving people what they deserve in a digital space or what they've earned, rather, in a digital space and allowing them to have the assurances that they really own it. And that's all an NFT is. It's a representation of digital ownership of a digital object, which could represent a physical thing, a game item, a piece of art, um, a print. It could represent a lot of things, a deed to, you know, a deed of ownership for something in the real world. So, you know, that concept to us is, there's so much potential in, in this. I mean, we're barely glossing the surface, even just with this sort of lofty discussion. I think trillion dollar industries will be disrupted by the NFT, by the concept of NFTs and what we can do with them. So we want to pave the way forward for that and, you know, setting our vision on this digital sovereignty for all, uh, we felt was something that we could always come back to and use as a guiding post. And here, if you have any thoughts, I'll pass it to you. Sure. You know, I, I think uh, one of the things that you see out there now is um, you're starting to see more attraction from larger companies with bigger resources. And um, they're doing what by nature they would do, which is they take their expertise and their funding and they kind of glom it all into their own version of something. Or they will do a, they'll, they'll do something on a chain in their own private way. And what we're trying to create here is the opportunity for people who don't have necessarily the resources to build the backplane of something, utilize tools that we make, that we make accessible for other people to make tools on top of so that they can actually express and bring, you know, motion forward um, for the, for the collective without uh, having to be controlled and stuck in an environment that um, would, uh, would otherwise be, you know, controlled by large corporations, et cetera. So we're trying to give the little guy a leg up. We're trying to give the little guy the ability to express and grow and give them the tooling that they need to push forward faster. I think that's one of the directions that EOS wants is to be able to build more community, more uh, uh, user base, stronger tooling, and uh, uh, more effectuate stuff so in order to do that we really need to be able to let people be recognized for what they can do and provide them the base or the back plane as i kind of say it uh to get there so this this kind of all circles around the digital sovereignty of of having that together okay with all that in mind that's that was a that was a really great summation of what motivates you guys to do the work that you're doing um let's take a look at the actual um facings creator now and you can give us a little tour and show us what's going on there thanks brandon i appreciate the opportunity to actually kind of showcase some of our work um that we're very proud of so uh i think they start on the on the first page where you kind of log into creator.facings.io um you will see a um a uh explorer and this is basically the building block of understanding what's already out there so 
while this is rudimentary in terms of searching and stuff like that, the, the intent here was to just say, okay, we can put stuff on here. We can at least scroll through and get access to existing content. And, uh, and we'll further build that out as we progress with, uh, with our milestones. But this is the, the core of, you know, here's kind of stuff that, that exists in the, uh, the eosphere from, uh, uh, from on, the, on the EOS's uh, blockchain. We also have uh, the ability to toggle between, between the mainnet and jungle four. So that gives us the ability to do everything that you want to do in a test environment and deploy it out there. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that right now because I think uh, uh, one run through kind of the whole process here would be uh, uh, would be best suited for our limited time. But uh, you, we do have that option. So you could actually stage everything in Jungle 4. And then once you like how it all looks, you could then redeploy it on, on the mainnet. So what we'll do is we'll go into what's called My Collections and create a collection. And... Uh, Essentially, what we're going to do here, you'll see, is it's very familiar. You got, uh, for those of you who have uh, created collections and NFTs before, we try to stay basic and sh you know, show you guys things that you're familiar with and make it kind of simplistic so that you can, in this milestone of the process, be able to generate collections, uh, templates, and uh, schemas and, and NFTs based upon you know a very uh, rudimentary way, but to get it started so that it's all here when we build the building blocks and the backplane for this so that we can start adding in the really cool stuff after. So here you can just add a collection manager, uh, add a collection image. You can just go and grab one. Uh, it's just quick. It automatically opens up in your browser. You can grab an image. Uh, right here, I grabbed an image of a, uh, a rubbed project. Um, so uh, hopefully nobody owns this one. Um, and, uh, uh, and then we can uh, title it in uh, here for the collection name. So the collection name uh, has to be uh, 12 characters, which is the, the standard for creating um, uh, the, uh, the domains for these. But then you can go ahead and, you know, kind of call it whatever you want to. So we'll call this Santa Maria rubbed. And, uh, yeah. When, when the, um, collection is created, that's its own account essentially on EOS or. Yeah. So the layering, how this goes is, is you'll create your collection name. That collection name is very similar to when you're creating an account name, a standard account name, you know, it has to be 12 digits, 12 characters. And that will be forever the collection name for here. So under here, if you understand the tiering, or even if you don't, maybe I should explain it real quick. It starts with your hierarchy of your collection name, which that's going to be how EOS finds you when you're doing searching for different collections and everything else. And everything will be underneath that. So that's your highest tier. Below that, you'll have a tier called uh, schema. And schema might be a, you know, let's say you were going to do the Santa Maria from 19 or 1885. And then you want to do another year of pictures or NFTs from that. You could have two separate schemas that would be delineated by that. Below schemas, you have what's called templates. So if you think about it, you have your kind of your hierarchy of this is all about the Santa Maria. And then your next level down, which is called schema, is going to be you, you could divide it into like years of production or you could divide it into wars or you could divide it into games associated with that. And then below those, you could even break it down into further parts, which are called templates. And those templates can be things like, you know, I want to focus on NFTs for sales. I want to focus on NFTs for cannons. I want to focus on NFTs for backgrounds or stuff like that. So there's a, there's kind of three main tiers on analog chain with the atomic assets platform that give you the ability to, to delineate where you are in something. So we're right now at the, at the hierarchy, the, the highest point, which would be the collection name. And when you're creating these, you're doing all these with your account too. So they're, they're tied to your account as well. So anybody who searches these collections will also know who the creator is as well and, and go back to that way. The random too, <clears throat> on, on your question about accounts, sorry to butt in here. The, every collection has an author. Whoever creates the collection is the author. But if you want a short collection name, similar to short names for accounts on EOTS, then you have to own the short name. So you have to go buy the account for the short name, then you can have a short name collection. So that's Good just a little caveat there. Is the collection name 
prominently displayed in various, you know, front ends where it would be seen where that might be of value to have a fancy short name, premium name? Yeah, the sec the main secondary market is Atomic Hub. So if you go to eos.atomichub.io, in the left sidebar, you'll see that the top level search is on the collection names themselves. Okay, cool. That's that's good to know. And thanks for that great overview of, you know, for a lot of people like myself, I haven't really minted a, I, I don't think I've ever minted an NFT, to be honest. And although I've played around quite a bit and bought and sold NFTs, it's nice to get a conceptual understanding of like how everything's kind of organized. And that was a really helpful summation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, no, and, and we, you know, this is, this is the, uh, kind of the back room for anybody who's been on the surface just on the collecting or the implementing side you know actually creating one is uh it's kind of fun um and uh and there's a lot you can learn from doing this about how nfts interact with the chain and things so uh, i recommend everybody try it at least try it on testnet uh and and get it there but uh um definitely if you have something worthwhile create create a collection and uh, bring more people on board to check it out so um so we move from uh, uh entering in you know basics about your collection uh we did the collection name display name website and then you get to set a market fee so it's between zero and 15 percent and this is the the fee that you would collect if you sold your nft or somebody else resold it it's kind of the secondary sales on what would happen and what percentage of that sale would come to you there's also the sales that go to the chain percentage that goes to the chain to support the chain etc so uh, so we commonly put you know somewhere five ten percent or something like that for this one i'm going to put ten percent because i know nobody's going to buy my rugged collection here and the uh, chain fees only exist on wax okay got that goes to their deep buy system eos doesn't have that but the atomic team would still take their percent of Correct. the secondary yeah. fee let's come back to that in a little bit i'm curious to know some of like to compare and contrast a little bit there, um, the WAX and EOS state, but I'll keep going through the um, the demo first. Sure. Uh, so you can put a description here. You get pretty lengthy um, leeway in terms of what you want to put on here, but anything that you could do to, to help people understand what it is you're trying to put out there so that they can have a reference point to it. You also have the ability to add in a social media uh, into here so twitter medium facebook github and we've got a, a slew of stuff that you can tie into there as well and then company details for instance if you wanted to put yeah to really solidify your strength and who you are and not be somebody you know hiding behind a mask you can put and you want to really sell something and, and get some attention you could totally dox yourself here with the collection as well uh, look, sure looks like it yeah well, you know, it's it's uh it's it's where things are kind of going for the production side because there's just too been too much of the nonsense on the other side. So uh, you know, we kind of see how that happens. Um, so then you would go and you would uh hit create the collection, and what did I do here? I did too many. Oh, sorry, I used a zero. There we go. Uh, yeah, no zeros. Uh, what did I say? Oh, five. Yeah. <laughs> There we go, of course. And you click on create the collection and then it would create the collection. And you'll you'll see here, now we have our collection has kind of shown up. These are all other collections that I have. You can see I like to spend a lot of time with rugged projects. And I'm sorry, here, let me just get rid of that. And we can open up our collection. And in here, now what we will do is we'll create a schema um, so we'll click on schema and uh, we'll go to, to the creation part of that. So again, this is still follows the same standard of what we were talking about before. It needs to be 12 characters because that's the interface with the Atomic Asset standards. So, um, and again, I, I don't think you can short name this. Rob, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this part has to you kind of... Can, you can short name the schemas. Okay, great. So you can do that as you well. You can also dot delimit them, similar to how uh, EO's names can have a dot in them. Only if you own the short name can you put a dot in it on EOS, but with these, you could just be like, for instance, on Dark Pinup, which is Lars Kamenizu Spate's first NFT collection, we put like 
Act One dot cards. Act One dot promo. Act One dot packs. So we were able to separate by acts and by type in the schema name. Nice. Yep. So here, what you're doing is you're you're creating a second tier of hierarchy. So we have one hierarchy above this. Then we have schema. I'm going to call this one Santa Maria OG. So we're going to kind of go to the old school original stuff here, the full on rugged adventure. And um, you, you come up with two uh, recommended or three recommended pieces of data that you will, intro you will introduce to your NFT in your templates. So this is all about creating a platform for what type of information are you going to be putting into this NFT once you start creating them. Um, it's not saying that you're defined to any particular image or any particular text. It's just saying we're going to you're going to choose what you're going to have all your templates look like in terms of information, and then you can change them and have multiple templates underneath this schema. So does that make sense, Brandon, and how I just described it to you? Yeah, so far so good. Awesome. So we, right now what we have is this would be your name, um, and you could call this one, you know, we'll call this one Santa Maria OG2. But afterwards, you put the image, which would be the JPEG that we have there. And you could put a video back or text, et cetera. And then you could continue to add uh, attributes here. And you could call them whatever you want to. So this would be, you know, rug status. And then you can change that to lots of different pieces. We put standard ones here for now. But as we continue to grow with our milestones, we'll open them up because the Atomic Assets has a lot of options here. So you could have a text piece here. You could have force it to be a number. Um, you could put a floating point number. You could make another image. You could put it as IPFS hash um, or, or even go Boolean. So we're going to leave this one as an integer number. And then we can go ahead and, and create our schema. So here. There we go. Okay, where am I? <laughs> All right, so we go into the the schema, and uh, you can actually go back after it's created. You can go back into the schema, and you can continue to update that as well. So it's not everything isn't permanent except for some basic pieces, but you can continue to add attributes at that point in time. But uh, what we want to do is we want to go back here and we want to make a template, which I've already done, but I'll do another one here too. And the template is going to be, this is going to be specific to the NFT we're creating. So this template is going to generate all of the NFTs below it. So they will all be identical with the difference of mint numbers and potentially mutable attributes if you choose that. So... This is the, the kind of the, the, the third tier of what you're doing in terms of creation. You started out with the collection name. We went into the schema, which is the, the, the tier below that. And now we're into the templates, which, which is this is defining each one of the NFTs that we're going to produce or each series of NFTs, I should say, based upon your supply of them. This one looks like it's geared up for, so we're going to grab the schema that we want to put it under. And then we're going to say, decide whether or not we want to be able to transfer these assets, which is interesting. So you could actually mint NFTs directly to a wallet that have to stay there forever, which is always fun to play jokes on friends. Um, or you can uh, make them so they'd be transferred, which is typically uh, what most people do, because the goal here is to be a community and share assets and create lots of fun stuff to, to pass around. Uh, and then uh, again here, you have the ability to burn your assets uh, or other people to burn them. So if collectors don't want them or you want to reclaim resources or things like that, assets can be burned. And, and the assets can only be burned by the holders, though, as we probably already know. But I figured I'd just throw that out there. Max supply. So here's how many NFTs we're going to introduce to the world under this template. So I'm only going to pain people with five instead of having 100 because it's not going to be super desirable, though, and then I'm coming up with here. But now here's your creative fluids. I get to start pumping here. So we get to make five NFTs under the, all the hard work we just put in and creating a collection name and creating a, uh, uh, a schema. This is the template where we get to call them and, and do whatever we want to. So we can call, and, and this text string right here is whatever you want it to be with some minor limitations with odd characters and stuff like that. But mostly if you want to do you know straight text and capitals and stuff like that, you can. So. We're going to call this the uh, the Santa Maria uh, 
OG rug because I'm just fixated on rugging. So, and this is this data here is immutable. And what that means is, is that after we save this template, that cannot be changed. If we wanted to make it mutable, that would mean that we could call it this and later on, we could actually change this field for all NFTs to fall under it. So very interesting uh, thing that you can do on the atomic asset standard in terms of uh, deployment and management of NFTs over time. So lots of cool stuff here, advanced features for sure. You can't change a name of an NFT after it's been minted, can you? Or uh, what is, how does that work? You can if it's mutable. Yes. You, so <clears throat> the collection author can instruct for any NFT in the collection that has a field defined as mutable hmm. to be updated. So this allows you to create evolving NFTs, game items that progress and change over time. You could have an NFT that changed the image based on the weather outside because you can update. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're little programs. Up. NFTs are... So, yeah. So, so let me get this straight. So the NFT creator, <laughs> like... I could create like a bunch of mutable, mutable fields and then somebody mm -hmm. could acquire the NFT and then I could slowly like alter the NFT. Absolutely. Uh, that, that they have in their collection over time. Absolutely. Yep. But they'll know it's mutable too, though. You can't hide right. the fact that it's mutable. So they'll know they're buying an NFT that says it's mutable. So then they, they know they're trusting the collection manager to make sure that not the collection manager, the collection owner, that they're not going to that they're doing what they intended with it, which is, I assume you buy a project with mutable data for a specific reason. Right. The so other downside to mutable is it increases the RAM cost significantly. So significantly. You, you, have, you have to pay for RAM on every single mint instead of at just the template level. When you create a template, you put data in that template and you could have... a thousand nfts and they're all just using the data in that one template so if all that data was instead mutable the amount of ram we pay would be a thousand times greater so you really have to be careful about picking and choosing the right places to use mutable data so you pay the ram up front whether or not you ever change it yes yes exactly for every character in mutable data, you pay as the proportionate amount of RAM. Yeah, and, yep. and that's just the way it works because you got to think about it this way. If I have a thousand NFTs that have a mutable data field and they're all changing in different things, I have to trap each of those separately on the chain. I can't just... So that's why. Gotcha. That's a cost to the extra. network that needs to be accounted for. Yep. Mm -hmm. But think of the uh, benefit you could do with this. Let's say you want to be, uh, uh, you're the, the weather channel and you want to uh, send out uh, free NFTs to the world that uh, have their localized weather. You could have mutable NFTs with templates for their specific regions. And, you know, every day it could, it could just rotate with new information for them all on the NFTs. So it, it, it really furthers the point of where NFTs get to become more than just, you know, these static images. They become actually living and breathing objects, digital objects that can, are programs that can be executed by the creators. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, I had a bit of an aha moment during this because nice. I, was, I was like, so I could write a letter, for instance, like I write a note to a friend, send it to them. But the next day I want to like add to that theoretically. Right, you could totally Snapchat it. You could just be like, dude, if you don't check this yeah. out in five minutes, it's gone. You know, I profess my love to you and now it's over. <laughs> <laughs> but if they were savvy enough, they could go look at the uh, block. It's Rob, don't ruin it for everybody. <laughs> in a previous block. That's the beauty of blockchain. It's all there. You can always figure out what it was. Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, like, it'd be fine if the record was there, potentially. Like, yeah, but um, yes. All right, that's cool. And, that's and remember, yeah, whenever you're making something, even if you're making it mutable, these transactions are are occurring on your account. So whoever the creator's account is, or whatever the the short name is that's that's recording all this, wherever that goes to, that log is on that account. So all the information is there. So it's not like you can create secret 
uh, things that nobody will ever know about. It's more about you know using these in a useful way. Um, so gotcha. I hope they straighten that out. And we slowed down the tens of thousands of people making crazy things that don't move from people's accounts. Yeah, people. right. <laughs> hey, slow down, everybody. Hey, we, hold on. Yeah. We we know who you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, so then we have, uh, uh, so that was fun. We made the name, um, and then we can, uh, go in here and, and add an image. So I'm going to grab my, uh, uh, my image. Uh, I think we, we're going to go here. So this is, uh, instructions for port ownership for uh, the Santa Maria that I created. Actually, this is my handiwork, so I can publish this anyway. When we add the JPEG in here, we're actually going to go ahead and generate an IPFS hash for you through the chain and, and through the system here. So that that's already being done. So you don't have to add a, you don't have to preemptively do an IPFS hash for this. You can just literally drop in the JPEG as you can see right here. And again, you can make this mutable or immutable. You can add video. I don't have any ready, so we're not going to do that field, but we can just go ahead and create the template here. So now we're in this, in the, the, the point of the process here where we we have created the basis, all the, all we need to do to start creating NFTs. So what's really cool about it. So now this, when we're done creating that template, we've got a template number. That template number has this specific information with it. So here's our information here. It's burnable. It's transferable. There's a supply of zero because I haven't created any NFTs yet. And I have a max supply of five. Immutable data. We didn't choose any. Immu uh, excuse me, we didn't choose any mutable data, so all of the data on this uh, is immutable, which means it cannot be changed. And then we can go back to my collections. We can go back in here and we can look at uh, uh, our templates, uh, which we have here. I created one before, two here, and then we have this one. Then we can look at NFTs. So we're ready to create an NFT. So I'm going to ask you, Brandon, you know, do you want to create your first NFT with us? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm just past it. I don't want to count this as my first NFT because you're driving, but okay. I'm, this is the first time I've been through the process and I'm, it's very exciting. In fact, awesome. this gives me the confidence that I could actually create an NFT and not just be like stuck for hours trying to figure Anybody out. Anybody can. If you have a picture that you want to utilize and if you have some information that you want to put down, you can create one. It's that easy. Um, that's why we made it this, this basic piece here so that we have this back plane that we can build upon. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and click on create our first NFT. We have the Santa Maria 11. We have two potential templates to choose from. This one that we just created or this one that I created earlier. Do you have a preference on which way you'd like to go? Choose your own the adventure ship, kind of thing here? The ship. All right. We're going with the ship then. All right. Perfect. So now in the, uh, uh, in the creation, uh, we've selected our schema. We selected our template. Asset data. So now we can actually determine where we want to send this. Havana Banana is me, um, so that would go to me, or I could send it to your account if you like. And I can create as many of the NFTs as I've determined can be created. So, for instance, here we have number of copies. It tells us this between one and five. That, that number selection is based upon the number five that we had put in there for how many NFTs we can create. So right now, I'm just going to create two. And I could create, if you have an EOS account, maybe you guys don't want to do this online here, so... Uh, no, wait, fine. So, I have a pub. I have a public EOS account, um, which is uh, B. Dot Lovejoy, I think. Right? Yeah, B. Dot Lovejoy. Okay, and uh, we can send you two as well. I just told me don't run out of resources, but we should be good to go. Um, and uh, and then once that's uh, completed, then we'll have uh, we'll still have one left that we can mint. Uh, immutable attributes are here. This is, uh, again, so I'm trying to click here to change it. It's not allowing me to because it is, like we say, immutable. Um, mutable attributes, we don't have any, but we do have a field here. We can go ahead and add in a, a mutable video if we wanted to. That video carries through just in case you had a file that you wanted at the end. But we don't have anything, so we're going to go ahead and create these assets. Assign my transaction over here. It says it was successfully created, so... What's going to happen now is we've been pushed back to our Rugged Maria template, uh, our asset numbers. And <laughs> you like that, right? Um, I love that. And then, if, and, and then if I go to, if I go to my, uh, uh, the transfer tab here, it'll actually show you the assets you have. Um, these are still populating in terms of mid numbers. 
Um, and I believe I chose mine first, but if you look in your account, you should see uh, two uh, Rugged Maria NFTs in your collection as well that they're now available for you. And if you don't have them, what, what did you say your account was again? Uh, B.Lovejoy. That? Lovejoy. I'll check it out then. And two more for you. And so now <laughs> we come oh, to the. Did you know Brandon's actually a sailor? I didn't that's the, know. That's the funny part about all this, but it's great. Um, oh, well, I'm a big boater too. So, you know, I, uh, uh, and I love tall ships. So this is a experience for me to get, you know, wrecked by something you love. So, uh, <laughs> that's just easy. The other benefit to, uh, uh, the creator that we have here is a transfer feature. Um, and this is, again, this is a, uh, the limited milestone that we completed for the first grant. So this, this does basic transfers. So I, you put in your account that you want to send them to, and you can put whatever memo, which will be there for, uh, forever on the chain in the history. Uh, you can filter through your collections. If you've got a lot here to choose from, uh, I don't want to show you what's in there. Cause I don't know. Cause we use my account as a test account. So people send me stuff that are pretty funky, yeah. but you can search through things there and whatever I've selected two NFTs to go to you. There's your account name. My message to you, the NFTs that I've selected for you to, to get, and I click on this transfer NFT button. And guess what? You've got two NFTs on the way. So you should have a total of four in your account, which is really cool. And now, just to show you kind of what happened, so we created those four. Don't forget, we still have one more left. So we could always go back to our collection whenever we feel like it. Go to NFTs. These are the four NFTs. And look, they, they're all in your account, it's telling me that. I can go to create NFT. I can go select the rugged Maria again. And it says I have between one of one and one. So I only have one left. So I can make one more if I wanted to. And I think that concludes the, uh, uh, the tour of the action items here. I would also recommend that everybody, if you're interested in the source code and understanding more about that, to click on the about uh, tab here. It tells us our purpose and why we did this. A little bit about that, which you've already heard access to our source code, uh, our design principles, where we're doing these core features um, about the atomic assets um, standard and about facings. But I also recommend if you do have any issues or, or bugs or find anything for us, please let us know. We'd love to hear about it. And that concludes my tour of the collection manager or creator, I should say. And on that point about the bugs, please do File those as GitHub issues under the yeah. Action Manager link that Kier just mentioned in About. We're looking for as much feedback as possible, so we'd love to hear how you think we could make this better, feature requests, any issues you have trying to use the tool. All of that feedback is welcome and appreciated. Awesome. Yeah, I'll make sure to include that in the show notes with a little note to submit bugs there. And anything else that you y'all want me to include oh uh, just you know this was uh um this presentation was sponsored by uh rugged uh nfts across the world obviously all right <laughs> i might have to back up and explain a little bit of your your, your obsession with uh, with rugged projects really quick do you want to like give fill people in i uh, sure it's a two-second one uh Got in the space, super excited. Had some really great successes early on with Rob and and collections that were launched, and uh, and then really wanted to dive deep and uh, found out what uh, what the pioneers of the universe over here were trying to do, and and uh, so try to sift through that and find the real people. Uh, unfortunately, you got to uh, step on a lot of thorns, and uh, I think I stepped on all of them. Um, but now we're doing lots of good things, so that's that's the thing, and I'm. I'm by no way or means uh, uh, upset about it. It's just a huge learning experience to get in here. And one of the reasons why we want to create tools that are easy for people to use that they don't have to, to worry about. Yeah, for sure. So, so basically, gear got a scam. <laughs> over. Yeah. And, and over. I don't know if anyone, over. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anyone watching will not know the term rug, but. Right, no, I'm sure they will. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Pull rug out. Actually, if you look at yeah. one of my collections, I think it's a, there's a visual there for you. See, that was my first one. Was the uh, oh, nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. So cool. So now we have the rug to Maria. And if anyone watching this wants to leave a 
note in the comments. I will send you my other three Reich Marias if you include your Bios. Look at that. So you'll have an original Reich Maria. I'm actually going to make sure. sure. Yeah, but you know what? I'm going to make sure that you get four to distribute. So let's go. Oh, did I? Okay. You get well. you have you have four now, but I know you're keeping one. So what I want to do oh, is let's make oh. let's make the last one and write into mint it right into your account as the originator is L dot what was it again? I'm sorry. B dot mm, Lovejoy. Yeah, B dot Lovejoy. All right. So that will be the uh the final asset in routes to you. And it's successfully created. So there you go. So now you should have all five of this collection in uh, there, so you can you can send out four now and keep keep mint. Thanks, yeah, thanks for yourself. thanks for making my promise not an empty promise. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> like you said, you had four. <laughs> so wow, that was great. Um, yeah, I feel uh, I feel like even because you know I've looked at the atomic assets interface before, and I get about you know I get so far, and then I'm just like. Uh, collection schema i don't know what all this means and and i'm just kind of not you know sure bold enough to go into the those waters and press buttons and not really know what the outcome is going to be so so this is cool um i have a question on that though so in terms of documentation or i mean you know, apart from this this is going to be a great little walkthrough for people um do you all plan on producing content that is like you know, tutorial type information or just like really beginner type information. Cause I feel like that'd be really helpful. I mean, like even what you went through with. Didn't we just, just do that? Yeah, <laughs> we did. But in case, in case people don't watch this video, like I want to see yes. almost like a, like a visual, a visual guide, like a single page visual guide to collection there, schema. There will be a docs link in the future. It's something we actually have been discussing. And um, so we do intend, you know, we do intend to continue to put a readme or markdown documentation into the code repo itself, collection manager. That's more for people who want to use that code and customize it. For the publishers, they need their own docs portal too. That's yeah. an understood need. And I do intend to get to that. Yeah, sweet. So you mentioned Wax during this, and Wax does things a little bit differently. I'm curious, based on your experience now with the Wax and the and EOS blockchains, are there any like gaps in terms of functionality on EOS that you'd like to see? Like, where are the things that like what is Wax doing really good? Because obviously they got a huge head start in terms of NFT functionality and stuff like that. Where do you see room for improvement on EOS and well, what are you doing about it? <laughs> and uh, are, like, what can what can be done? And um, yeah, like, how are the models different? So perhaps you could just the biggest game changer for Wax, which is the reason they're the most active blockchain in the entire blockchain space on a daily basis, is the fact that they have the Wax Cloud Wallet, which is a custodial wallet which functions like a web2 login and this allows anyone who knows how to use the internet but doesn't know how to use web3 and crypto to participate eos could definitely use a custodial wallet i heard there's you know discussion about this so i'm not really sure where that is or who's leading it up but um that's a major, major need. And it isn't like some trivial, easy thing. You have to have some company who really deeply understands security and blockchain and liability. And the reason Wax is able to, was able to execute on that is because they've been pioneering the digital asset space for over 20 years with things like skins and Counter-Strike and other digital assets, even before NFTs were a thing. So they have a lot of experience securing that type of thing and we're able to execute this wallet in the way that it needs to be. So that's a major one. Um, another thing that Wax has, there is a minor code change in the actual core node code. So that would be Leap, uh, if anyone's 
heard that term being thrown around. Wax has a modification which allows it to have this smart contract for random number generation. That's really important for the pack opening use case. So that's actually, whereas Facings isn't in a position, like we would have to have massive funding to execute on something like the Wax Cloud Wallet. Helping create or port, you know, a random number generation facility for smart contracts to leverage is something that we would be able to help with because we intend to enable pack creation and opening on EOS. So, you know, of course we could just have our own source of randomness off chain, but what's nice about the uh, random number generation, how it works on wax is it's all on chain. So that helps with the, uh, you know, trust minimized nature of smart contracts and provable fairness when you're, uh, giving, uh, you know, there's diff usually with these packs, there's different chances to get different rarities. So that's important for that to not be subverted or gameable because the product relies on that fairness. So yeah, we, you know, that's definitely something that we'll have to think about. What's the best source of randomness on EOS? Is there, is there an element of having that randomness generated at the level of the blockchain that also is kind of insulates developers from any potential like liability with, you know, producing the randomness themselves? Probably. The yeah. Same. Yeah. 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 Fairness on top of you get, yeah. yeah. If you're if your special EOS app product gets hacked, your backend gets hacked as a developer, and then someone starts putting in, let's just call it evil randomness, in order to <laughs> game game it and get all the rares. Let's just say, yeah. You know you don't ha you don't have that potential attack vector if the randomness is generated on chain. Gotcha. So that's pretty important. There are, you know, there is more trading volume in NFTs. There are more projects developing on Wax for NFTs at the moment. That's because there's tooling to do so and a user base. The user base comes from that Wax Cloud wallet piece because it's easier to bring in new users that aren't used to this world. They don't have to go through the arduous account creation process. Now, you know, understanding where EOS is, we still intend to address that by making it at least easier to get an EOS account. So, you know, onboarding flows are going to be key regardless of its, if it's custodied or not, as far as the wallet goes. Um, so, you know, we do intend to adapt to the, whatever is available and, uh, the, you know, the best practices as EOS continues to evolve this year, we will want to adopt those into our products too. Maybe that's something like Unicode, if that takes off and becomes popular. But right now, you know, we're using tried and true Anchor. So thanks, Gray Mass team, for all of the awesome work on that, which has enabled many teams to just plug in authentication and go. Let's see. Otherwise, you know, a major difference, and not just to talk about things EOS is lacking, one of the things I think is a huge benefit for EOS. One, the power-up model makes costs for resources much more predictable for a business. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome, personally. I mean, you know how it goes when you're staking CPU in that and you've got to juggle delegations. Well, what if you have a bunch of new users and they don't understand all of that and they just want it to work? Well, now what do you do as a business? Do you have WAX you just stake into everyone and give them some free transactions? Well, what if the network becomes congested and goes into strict mode? So now the costs of CPU have increased dramatically and the users don't understand that. So there's all of these things that cause a bad user experience in the old stake for CPU model that I think in some ways are addressed with the power-up model, although not entirely, because 
the business who's paying for power-ups needs to have a revenue stream so that they can continue to pay for power-ups. So for something like this, thankfully, we're not in a space where the cost of power-ups are high. You know, we intend to auto power up and things like that in the future, but there are great options for that already on EOS, such as uh, uh, powerup.io and the powerup bot uh, by the Boyd team. So, you know, thankfully, that's not a big issue right now, but I just think that's a much more predictable model for businesses that are trying to make, you know, a product on EOS. And also, you know what I'd like to see? Yeah, go ahead, Kier. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Rob, please. Oh, just the last point I wanted to make was another huge really? benefit of EOS is the fact that it actually secures the system with the top 21 block producers. Wax does not. Wax uses admin.wax. Again, their team is expert at digital security. So you can trust them to secure the system but we don't have that same level of representation of the token holders and, you know, BP governance that EOS has on WAX. We just don't. They're just secured differently. And I, I personally like the more decentralized form of security. So I think that is an advantage that EOS has. Cool. Then uh, did you have something to add to that, Kier? Uh Yeah, I just wanted to say I think the interesting thing is is that um you know I, I don't really put it head to head that way i think they're they're different chains uh, uh currently and they're actually complementary because you're looking at a ecosphere that's based upon similar technology which will be by its nature be able to cross pollinate very easily and so i think having some unique differences between them gives us the advantage of being able to move quicker in different directions between these two chains to fight the things that we see out there with the, you know, the other chains where, where there's more difficulties like Polygon or Ethereum or Avalanche and stuff where I think we have so many more advantages over all of those, but growing the, the Avalanche, the, the antelope message of, you know, the, the efficiencies and the quickness will bring more people here and, and we can share those uh, consumers between both chains. So I, I see this as something that will grow together, probably more than apart. There's, there's already evidence of that in the major producers on both chains are very similar people. Um, and uh, the, the atomic acid standard, obviously, uh, uh, is, a, is a testament to that. So it'll be, it'll be nice to see. But I did want to add one of the deficiencies that I see on, uh, on EOS that uh, I think could be you know, rectified pretty well is, is the, the introduction or the the better use case or better implementation of uh, fiat uh, purchasing uh, through the system because it's, it's kind of non-existent on EOS. And, and that's a limitation to bring in new uh, um, inexperienced people into the chain. Yep, definitely. Something we may be able to help with too. Yeah, we do actually have plans to be able to do that. But uh, Please do. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we need, we need a little boost to get there. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah. One other interesting complementary idea that keeps coming back to me as far as how can EOS and WAX be symbiotic? Well, we understand that inner blockchain communication for Antelope is rolling out. Both yep. EOS and WAX are in the Antelope Coalition, which means That's that right. they're both working together to set the core development priorities and, you know, fund those in different ways and you know there what does eos have that wax doesn't well for one it has stable coin liquidity uh there are no liquid stable coins on wax as far as i know and there are really really important use cases that we want to build that relies on stable coin liquidity so will ibc allow us to leverage EO stable coins in WAX apps? Probably. I haven't done the research yet, but that is something I'm really interested in seeing happen where there's these strengths on each and we can use IBC to like pull in the strength of these different networks to make the best app possible. Yep. 
Absolutely. I think IBC between the coalition, Antelope coalition chains is going to be a pretty big game changer. And yeah, I'm definitely seeing this more as kind of a like potential synergies than competition. I mean, there's so much room in the space and Antelope yeah. chains have a decided advantage on a lot of different, you know, ways of looking at things. For sure. So there's a lot we can... I guess I brought it up more like what what can we learn from how Wax has done it and and yeah how can we yeah I'm glad you guys leaned into the how can we cooperate rather than compete I mean they think it's yeah, like a co- coopetition kind of thing it's interesting because there's two different methods of uh, a creation you know one you have a corporation creation and the other one you have kind of a uh, uh, a conglomerate of uh, uh, of token holders uh, pushing the efforts so. It's really cool how they both developed. They both, you know, developed under different pretenses and kind of come to similar uh, needs and, and resources. Uh, and it's neat. And I think it'll grow together. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing all the different ways that IBC kind of opens up collaboration yeah. in the space. And and I think this is definitely one of those areas. And yeah, I, I mean, I've long wanted to see that kind of like super organism of antelope blockchains form so this is perhaps that moment beginning now and nfts so one other question before we wrap is just generally speaking or wherever you want to go with this i'm curious how you see the potential use cases of nfts on eos both you know for communities we see Eden kind of leveraging NFTs for reputation. We see, you know, there's all sorts of like potentials for, you know, galleries being created. What do you, what do you want to see people do with NFTs using these tools that you're creating and, and, and what additional functionality do you want to see? Uh, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to grab that one first and just go into that. Um, what I love about what the chain capabilities are is that and, and the atomic asset standard gives us kind of an endless ability to keep going um, if you look at other chains and the limitations of the functionality of nfts you know it's just there's, there's very strict guidelines in terms of what they can actually produce without being brought off chain and doing things off chain and then coming back in eos has the ability to do everything on chain uh with the standard which is where we want to be um and there's there the, the speed and efficacy of uh, doing any of these things is great. So the biggest pushers out there are finance, marketing, and gamification. Those are the big three pushers. And I think EOS has the opportunity right now to jump into gamification and look at NFTs as the stronghold for creating user ownership throughout a uh, uh, gamified experience, providing opportunities for not just ownership but potentially earning um and uh and that and all of that in a fun way so what we've been experiencing is the and one of the reasons we're creating this backplane is to be able to then create modules that kind of attack in we're calling them like plugins where you can do different things with these nfts whether it's uh blending them to cause something else to happen or whether it's having fun with mutable attributes as they affect your uh, status within a game or or stuff like that. So there's tons and tons of levels that you can go to, but we know the driving forces where all the money are, money is, is uh, in those three categories. And EOS already has a pretty good stranglehold on, you know, two of them. So bringing in this, uh, uh, you know, pushing the gamification pretense and, and allowing people to actually publish games with utility um, will really help drive uh, a, a bigger user base. And uh, in, my, in my opinion, it'll make the chain bigger and stronger and uh, and the use case for NFTs even better because people's imaginations will just start to grow. And I think it's pretty endless in what we can do with them. Awesome. Music to my ears. Rob? <laughs> yeah, games. I mean, that's going to... And I still believe and have for over a year now that games will be the main vector for mass adoption of NFTs because they're lower risk. They're, there's not a whole lot of regulation getting in our way as there may be with certain financialization. 
or securitization of NFTs. <clears throat> People like games, they're fun. There's, you know, hundreds of millions of gamers in the world today. So it's a massive audience. And, you know, we already see that the EOS network is orienting itself to be a hub for gaming. So there's the support of the ENF and others to that want to see that happen because I think they also understand that that is what going to be one of the main vectors for mass adoption. So to me, that's the obvious. Otherwise, yeah, I would like to see a really awesome art gallery because we know there's artists in our community that would love to be able to, you know, have their patrons on EOS, such as Lars. I would like to see, let's see, I, I go through use cases all the time and I'm drawing a play right now, but, you know, at the end of the day, these are little computers. NFTs are little computers. You can program them to do anything. So they could be keys. They can be access paths, paths is you can gate content or access to things with nfts you can use them to represent ownership in the real world which will take longer back to the vision we talked about earlier in facings um, a lot of the most potent and awesome use cases well they tend to be illegal <laughs> because you create unregulated securities i personally think that's bullshit I think that people should be able to own an NFT and receive cash flows without it being regulated, but that's the way the world works. You know, I would like to see a future where we can give the community a piece of facings business model in the future through either NFT or token ownership. These are things that cause us to run afoul of securities laws. So for me, it's not the technology getting in our way securitization of things like nfts are a really potent use case where you can literally create systems that are equitable that allow people to participate in sharing of the business model or you know really truly being a part owner of some greater thing but all of those use cases are almost outlawed unless you do a bunch of you know registration and kyc and all these different things that, that costs a lot of money which really kind of takes the air out of the potency. So for me, I mean, it's, again, it's the, the laws and regulations holding us back more than the technology and creativity, but that's okay. Let's focus on the things we can do right now while that stuff gets settled out. And hey, maybe in the future, some of us will have to run for government office and change things too. Who knows? <laughs> so yeah, yeah for me, you know, Web3 was always like, hey, the, the world's pretty fucked up and there's a lot of people suffering out there. Is that needless suffering? Is this something that we're just going to accept? What if we could create new economic ways of doing things that allowed people to be provided for in new and innovative ways or allowed them to tap into an earning potential or opportunity that they didn't realize they had? And again, that comes back to, well, if I securitize an NFT and I don't do it right, I'm going to end up in an orange jumpsuit. So I can't. So it's, it's a tricky thing right now. And honestly, where we're at in facings, we're a bootstrap startup. We're super lean. We can't go pay lawyers tons of money to help us figure this stuff out right now, to be frank. So we're going to mm -hmm. do the stuff that we know we can do and build towards what we no, and as we grow, we can get more sophisticated and try to tackle the bigger, more challenging issues in the space. Yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot to contend with. We need a, we need an EOS legal DAO team that can just help us all help us all out on that front. You know, if if multiple companies end up building on this this public good essentially and using that. What's the term you keep using, Kier? It's like a backscape or something. Oh, backplane. Back mm -hmm. But what is it? Backplane. 
I like it. It sounds sci-fi. But if, <laughs> yeah, multiple people are building on this public good backplane and they develop revenue generating models on top of that, perhaps there could be some sort of buyback and burn mechanism for, you know, whatever, take a percentage of EOS that's coming in through these things and, and burn it. And that would be a way of giving back to the token holders. I don't know if that makes any sense or kind of avoids a regulatory problems of giving people direct ownership of a product instead of just kind of helping everyone out that. It's an interesting thought, you know, something that we, we should discuss uh, and we can go through, but uh, interesting thought. We hadn't, we hadn't discussed uh, that path, but because uh, you hadn't thought of it, but that is an interesting way to, to deploy potential uh, uh, people. But we don't, what we don't want to do is we don't want to restrict anybody from being able to build on the backplane either. So we want to yeah. find it in it such a way where... It's voluntary, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. You know, it's it's GPL v3 licensed, which means anyone can use it for commercial purposes. And, you know, the adoption of an open source license was part of the grant framework requirements. Yep. So we were happy to do that, but exactly. It would have to be more of a, a social contract or something that is suggested. But there, there is another opportunity potentially, and I don't want to preempt, but you know, when EOS Network Ventures comes online, we will certainly be applying. And so the success of facing, say we were invested in, and this is again, hypothetical because I don't know anything about the fund, but we will, we will go for that fund and hypothetically that would be an indirect way to provide value back to the overall network too. Say we make the startup successful, it's a successful investment. You know, ENV is working on setting up, you know, their unique thing to drive value back to the EOS network. And so that could be a way where that occurs. But of course, very hypothetical, lots of details to figure out. They're going to be investing in revenue generating businesses. So we're going to have to get our revenue generation online, which is a big goal this year. So we can sustain and stick around longer. But yeah, you know, the collection manager is a stepping stone for us in that direction. And it also allows others to have a starting point as well for their own ventures. So. Yeah, you know, that's something we're we're definitely excited to learn more about. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to see the the ENV come online and I think that'll open up a lot of possibilities on EOS for people building. Guys, it's been a pleasure. Any final thoughts? Any uh anything you want to share, any links you want to drop, anything like that before we wrap. Well, I'll just throw out in, in case you can't read it, it's uh, creator.facings.io uh, and uh, go make some NFTs. You know, that's what we're here for. Cool. Yep. And if you want to chat or interact with us, we have a Discord, discord.gg slash facings. That is our main community chat area. So we would love to hear from anyone who wants to talk or ask questions. And again, if you have feedback that you want to formally report, you can do that under the GitHub issues for the collection manager as well. Otherwise, stay tuned. We're just getting started and looking forward to building a lot more on EOS. Thanks for putting this together, Brandon. Appreciate you giving us the time to show what's going on out here. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. I'm, I'm Happy to highlight an, an awesome project building with the help of the direct grant framework and just highlight the ways in which EOS and the ENF are supporting art and NFTs and gamification and all that good stuff. So it's a pleasure to have you guys. And thank you. I learned a lot today. So it's good. So thanks for joining us and I'll come back next time for another exciting episode of Everything EOS podcast. Until then. Thank you.